this is Dana Brownlee. I am so glad that you are joining us. I know it's probably just noon on the dot and people are still joining, but please tell us where you're joining from. Tell us in the comments. We want to hear where people are joining from. I always love that. So let us know in the comments. And I want to welcome my friend and colleague, Ruth Pierce. Say hello. Hi. Thank you, Dana. It's it's a real privilege and an honor to be here. So thank you for inviting me as a guest. I tell you what, we all love that British accent. I don't know about you, but <laughs> yeah, I, I love that British accent. And it'll be okay. So. Oh, I love that British accent. Uh, tell us if you love that British accent. Hi, Wendy. Wendy's here from South Florida. Tell us where you're from. We've got Philly in the house. You know, Karen is from Philly. I don't know, Kimberly, if you've been here when Karen is here, but she is from Philly. Oh, and Bahrain. Oh, my goodness. See, that is so awesome. Please, please type in the comments. I mean, I know it's it's a little trite, but I, I love seeing it. Tell us where you are joining from. We'd love to, to know that. So, oh, Allison Dukes Gilmore. Allison is here. Welcome. We, we both know Allison. All right, and we got Texas. So uh, please keep telling us where you're joining from, and I'm just going to keep going because I know we've got so much to talk about today. And today, I think, is one of those topics that I really, really wanted to get to because it's one of those things that you're not going to get a training class on. You're probably not going to read an article about it. There's not much out there about it, but I'm thinking if you're a white person or an ally who really wants to delve into anti-racism, you want to be an advocate, you want to be an ally, you might be nervous. I mean, there are a lot of white people that I talk to and they're like, you know what? I have these conversations or I want to have these conversations, but I'm nervous. Like, I think I'm going to put my foot in it. You know, I think I'm going to say the wrong thing. And so I think I might make it worse. So maybe I just shouldn't say anything. Does anybody feel that way? I mean, am I the only one who's channeling that? Um, and guess what? It's not just white people. Guess what? Black people are nervous sometimes <laughs> to have these conversations. Sometimes I think we're nervous that you're nervous. So it really can be anxiety inducing. And I think that that's normal. I don't think that we should feel bad about that. And so that's why I really want to own it. That's why I want that to be the topic. Um, and let me tell you a little story. So as I was thinking, you guys know that what I've been trying to do with these is I'm trying to, because I want these to be informal conversations, like real conversations that I'm really having with my real friends. I think that there's so much learning in that because sometimes when we hear it and it's too packaged and it's too prescriptive, it really doesn't help move the needle forward. You know, and I think that sometimes having those overly prescriptive, overly packaged conversations is why we haven't made a ton of progress. It's like we need to kind of get beyond that. We need to break the ice. We need to discuss the undiscussables. And so as I was going through my list, trying to think of people that I want to reach out to, and of course, I you know want to talk to white people, black people, brown people, everyone. I was thinking about my friend and colleague, Ruth. Um, because I've known Ruth for how long now? Like two, three years or so? More than that, because we uh, came to Atlanta after we met each other, right? So it's like okay. five or six, five years, I think now. Okay, so we share a publisher. And so that's how we first met each other. And we hit it off right away. I don't know what it is. We just had like a click. We, we really, really hit it off. And true story, when I emailed Ruth to ask her to be on the show, I said, you know, let, let's come up with a topic that you will be comfortable talking about. And she responded back and said to me, well, let's come up with a topic I wouldn't be comfortable talking about. You know, I really think it helps further the conversation if I get uncomfortable. I'm like, yes, this is why Ruth is my girl. OK, <laughs> this is exactly why. I mean, who else says that? You know, who else says that? So I said, you know what, Ruth, I think that needs to be the topic. Like if you and not to say that she's arrived or I've arrived, we're all on a journey. Absolutely. But to de have developed that level of racial stamina that you respond to your black friend with, well, no, I'm willing to be uncomfortable. Let's talk about something that's going to make me uncomfortable. You know, that shows that, that you really have developed some level of racial stamina. And I've said all the time, I think the two biggest barriers to moving forward in these conversations 
are dreadfully low levels of racial literacy. That's why understanding history is so important. That's why I post those history reminders every single day on LinkedIn and dreadfully low levels of racial stamina, just not being able to withstand, not being able to participate, being so worried and so anxious that we really can't dig into these conversations or we really can't be honest. We're just saying what we think other people want us to say, or we're saying what we think is safe enough for us to make it through the conversation. And that's not really getting us anywhere. So that's the evolution of how we came up with this topic. Um, again, let us know if anybody else is feeling that way. Let us know um, what questions and what fears and anxiety you have. And so Wendy's just chiming in, you know, I love that. Let's get uncomfortable. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. So with that, Ruth, let us first, can you just introduce yourself a little bit? Tell them a little bit more about who you are, what your background is, because I think that your background as it relates to character strengths is directly relevant to building that racial stamina. And if you're just joining us, please stay tuned because one of the last questions I'm gonna ask Ruth is what are her specific recommendations for how you can work to build that racial stamina. So we we'll just take a couple of minutes and introduce yourself if you don't mind. Sure. Thanks, thanks Dana, and thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction. So it only usually takes a couple of sentences for people to realize that I was originally British. I live in North Carolina now, and for 20 more years than I care to admit, I was a project manager, mainly in financial institutions, also, in state government and nonprofits. And during that time, I was fortunate to uh, cross paths with people from all over the world. And like you, I love seeing those things when someone's joining us from somewhere that right. to me is a little unexpected, I'm thrilled. We have a session that we do on uh, with the Institute on Character on Mondays, and we have people from all over the world. And it's just like, that is bringing people together. So I also, now I use the VIA character strengths and after cyber stalking them for two years, I got a job <laughs> with VIA on character, which is based in Cincinnati. Because one of the things I love about the character strengths, all science-based and everything, is that it's universal. And so it's one of those ways that I've, I've found that I can have conversations with people, which sort of, gets to our similarities and differences without necessarily jumping straight into, well, you're not the same as me because, you know, you don't have the same skin color or you don't have the life experience or whatever. At the same time, you have kindness. I have kindness. What does kindness look like to you? So um, I do a lot of work with the character strengths. I'm a group coach. We have a, a community of group coaches who work together and it's, it's definitely mixed in terms of white, brown, and black. We're working on expanding out to include you know, sort of other um, representation. And it's vital. It's absolutely vital to us to, to really know a variety of people. It makes us makes us more Absolutely. Rich. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And again, we're going to be coming back. If if anything you, that she said piqued your interest as it relates to character strengths, even project management, because we like to talk about this within the context of the workplace primarily. Stay tuned because we're going to be getting into that more. So with that, let's go ahead and begin at the beginning. Um, we want to get to know you a little bit because I do think that you're extremely evolved. Um, <laughs> and I think that that's that particularly cool. unique. Yeah. And I want to figure out how you got there. And I think that a lot of it was family background, environmental. There, there are lots of influences. But let's start at the beginning. So just share your earliest memories of race. Oh, um, I'm happy to. So I'll start by saying thanks, Dad. Thanks, Mom and Dad, actually. So I grew up in the longest village in the UK. It's called Mepham, and it isn't spelled at all the way it sounds. And so it's a long, long, narrow village with no sidewalks and stuff like that. And to say that it was a predominantly white place would be to completely understate. Understatement. <laughs> white, right. It was a white neighborhood. And I was born there, was growing up there, going to school there. And, quite, and, and back in those days, which is showing my age, we didn't have all the TV channels we have now. We didn't have access to all these movies and anything we did watch was in black and white. So it, the, there wasn't that um, 
access to seeing people who look different than me. So I was oblivious. I was totally oblivious as a child until we had a neighbor who moved in and she had moved from South London. And I was a curious kid. I was shy, but I was a curious kid. And I was always more comfortable with adults than other children because I we lived in a house that was quite isolated. And so I was used to run up and down the fence with this lady's dogs and sort of play through the fence and, and sort of do things with them. And I would talk to her. She was a, an avid gardener and I would talk to her. And one day, you know, curious little me, about eight years old, I say, so why did you move here? I won't say the person's name. I'm sure she's long gone, but why did you move here? And she said, because our, my husband and I had to get out of South London. And I was like, oh, why did you have to get out of South London? <laughs> I'm figuring they did something bad, you know, and someone said, you have to leave. I'm a little kid. I have right. to get out of South London. And I apologize for the language, but this is literally what she said to an eight-year-old child, is all the wogs and niggers were moving in and taking over the place. Ah. Oh. To an eight-year-old, right. To an eight-year-old. Right. I had absolutely no idea what that meant. And what's the first term? I know the wogs. second term. What is that? I don't even so know. Wogs, gen, well, it evolved. In the UK, it used to mean, um, I think, southern Mediterranean with a sort oh, of more okay. olive But right. over time, it became a phrase that was interchangeable with um, the N-word, as we call it. Right. So, yes, I've no idea what this means, but as a little kid, I can feel that there's some anxiety or or something negative, you know, in the way she delivers. She sure. didn't say, oh, all the wogs and niggers were moving in. She yeah. said, all the wogs and, you know, this face. So I go running into the house and I tell my mother about this conversation. And she blew up like a bomb. She was furious. And right. she went and spoke to this neighbor. She took me with her and she said, if if that's the kind of language you use, we you know we're a family where we're curious about other people, other people's experiences, and and um, we 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 don't generalize in that way. My mother was a social worker, so she was working with all mm -hmm. sorts of people, all sorts of social experiences and everything, educational experiences. So she went and gave this woman what for and said, if you're going to say things like that to my daughter, please don't speak to her because that mm. is not how we're bringing her up. And then she took me home and she explained what those words meant and she explained that that's not acceptable, not an acceptable point of view. You know, we don't look at people in that way. And it's about, and my father's thing was always, do you have anything interesting to say? He was endlessly curious about people. So most people have something interesting to say because they have an experience he didn't have, right? Mm -hmm. So my father comes home, my mother tells the story. He then goes around to the neighbor, absolutely livid, talks to the wife and the husband and says, "This it, that is total. what were you thinking? That's totally unacceptable. Those are people moving into the area and that phrase is... Um, I don't even know why you would use that phrase. And he knew full well why people <laughs> use that. Right, right, that, right. The message to me was that kind of categorization, that look of this, the sort of we're better than them, all of those things, completely unacceptable. And I'm eight, eight years old. So they like cut it off. They made yeah. it clear and not even just with their words, but with their tone. And I'm so glad they were so demonstrative. And that was such a gift. And it wasn't even, they could have very easily just pulled you to the side yes. and said, hey, we don't talk that way. This is not what we say. Yeah, and that would have been nice. the easier thing to do. Yeah. And I'm so glad because that's why sometimes people will push back on me um, about being public about things or because there's a learning opportunity. There's mm -hmm. a reason. It's, it's not just to embarrass the person, but it's to be very, very clear about the culture and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. They didn't just pull you over to the side. They said it to her. Yeah. Said this in is front not of in front of you. Yeah. And I think that makes all the difference. Sorry, yeah. what were you going to say? It wasn't a whisper. They didn't whisper right. in my ear. You know, we don't talk like that, but you have to right. kind of tolerate her doing it. It's okay. Right. Next exactly. exactly. It's like, it's not it acceptable. Bold and loud. And the thing was, that was not like them. So they were very much people who tackled things, but t typically it would be, you know, Ruth, let's sit down and talk about that and explain what's going on. Right. It was right. very unusual to see such direct action and such, what I would describe as fury. I mean, they were beside themselves. Yeah anger that this person had used this language and had conveyed this message. And this is also such a great 
example of why we're not doing our children a service by not talking about race. Right. You know, it, it's not helpful to just say, well, we love everyone and everyone's the same. I mean, that's just not true. OK, um, well, I mean, it might be true that you might love everyone, but mm. you have to realize that you cannot shield and protect your children from the reality of the society that they're growing up in. And if anything, you want to have these conversations so that you can equip them so that you can start them thinking about these things. One of the things that I love more than anything, because we do talk about race and gender and, and lots of things in our house, my, my nine-year-old will call me on. He'll be like, mom, that was sexist. What you just said was sexist, okay? And I love the fact that he's thinking about it, okay? And look for those opportunities. I was driving home from um, picking the kids up from school one day, and my, my son said, why are all the homeless people black? You know, why are all the homeless people black men? And so that's an opportunity to talk yeah. about lots of things, to talk about, I mean, I live in, you know, downtown Atlanta. And yeah. so that's, you know, an opportunity for me to talk about lots of things, talk about our city, the demographics of our city, talk about homelessness, talk about um, segregation. I mean, it's probably a little bit more than he wants on the 10 minute ride, <laughs> you know, back yeah, home. That's a simple answer, right? But yeah, yeah, but that's why I put this question out here and please let us know in the chat, how did your family impact your views on race? Ironically, I didn't even share this with you during our little pre-call, but I had a very similar experience. You know, we had moved into this neighborhood and we integrated a neighborhood. And, you know, for those of you who are white, think about that. Think about having to talk to your children about the fact that they're having to have a meeting about your family moving into the neighborhood. And it wasn't about the law. Everyone tries to go back to the law. It wasn't about the law. You know, KKK doesn't respect the law, okay? Or, you know, these uh, terrorists don't respect the law. My family, my parents wanted to ensure that we were not going to be terrorized, that, we, you know, we were not going to be treated badly. We were not going to be bombed. We were not going to have crosses burned on our lawn. And I literally remember my parents talking to me about that before we moved into this neighborhood. And then shortly after we moved in, I remember playing and being in the backyard and like our ball went into somebody else's yard and the little boy picked it up. And then when he was handing it back to us, he said, are you, got, are you the niggers? And I didn't know that was the first time that I can remember hearing that word. And so I didn't know if we were the niggers or not because <laughs> I didn't know what the word was. And so I remember going inside and asking my mom, are we the niggers, you know? And so that's when, you know, she started having more of that, that dialogue with me. But again, you're not protecting or helping or shielding yeah. your children. Of course, you want to be age appropriate with anything that you say. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, I think that your parents certainly um, did you a huge service. And that just, you know, shifts your mental paradigm. Not necessarily shifts it, but it begins to mold your mental paradigm. Well, it, it, so it was a watershed moment for me because if they had reacted in a different way, my whole path would have gone differently. And you were saying about your son calling you on being sexist right. about two or maybe three years after that incident. So, yeah, when I was about 11, my father used to travel to London for work. And we have our, um, the sort of uh, railway, railroad police force. They have their own police force or security. It's the equivalent of security, but I think they actually have the standing of a police person. And uh, a lot of them at that time, I can't comment now because I've been long gone and I don't, I haven't travelled on the trains in London for quite some time. But at the time, I would say probably fifty to sixty percent of the train, the the railway police were uh, black or brown. Mm -hmm. And my father got off the train one day. He was called to give evidence in court because he got off the tra train one day, and two guys were kicking and hitting a man who was on the floor. And when and my father was a rugby player. So this is another one of those things that if he hadn't been this, he wouldn't have done this. And what, my father was a rugby player. So he went, he had no idea who the person was on the floor or why anyone was hitting anyone. He just went and rugby tackled these two guys along with someone else. And they both pulled the two guys off. And it was wow. two white guys beating a black man. Mm -hmm. And the black man turned out to be one of the railway police. So my father was mm -hmm. called to court and said that was asked by the defense what was remarkable about the 
policeman. And my father said he was a little shorter than I would have expected for a policeman, but nothing was really all that remarkable. Mm -hmm. And the man said, well, did you, what did you notice about him? And he said, I noticed he was a policeman. And this carried on some time. And finally, my father said, I know what you're getting at, but it isn't unusual. It isn't remarkable. It's not noteworthy that he was a person with black or brown skin because 50 to 60 percent of, of, peop of people in that position are people of black and brown skin. Right. And when my father came home and told me the story you said about your son calling, my, <laughs> I said to my dad, well, dad, was that necessarily the way of handling it? Because then you drew attention to the fact that he was man of color when it's just a fact, right? His skin was brown. <laughs> no, and, I, and we got into this big family discussion about was the right answer to say, you know, he was a man with brown skin, black hair, five foot ten, whatever, or was it appropriate to to feel that they were trying to get at something and that the, the race somehow justified these two white guys kicking him I, I, whatever I don't know what was going on so we had a whole big discussion about that because what was the anti-racist thing to do to just be matter of fact about the person's skin color or to leave the skin color out of the conversation and you know what I'm deriving from that I, I don't know what the answer is because uh, and I think that's part of the message I think we want to give today is I think too often particularly white people go into these discussions saying I have to have the perfect answer. Yeah. I have to say the exact right thing. And for most of this is very nuanced. There isn't necessarily a perfect answer, a perfect thing. You and I were on a call with several black people where I think, I don't know if you asked or Allison asked, what do black people prefer to be called? Like, and they're different answers. You yeah. know, well, my, it was so much, two black, three black people. Right. On the and we, and we didn't even have the, the same answer. answer. Exactly. So yeah. it's, it's not about that. But what I'm deriving from also from what you're saying is there was so much value. I think part of the reason why, and you can you know correct me certainly, but I would assume that part of the reason why you might have been more comfortable later in life as an adult having these conversations in workplace settings was you would have them in your family already. Yes. If you get into adulthood and you've never talked about race, you've never used the term black or white or, or anything, and then you get into these workplace settings, because I mean, let's be honest, most of our neighborhoods are pretty segregated. It's pretty mm -hmm. easy to live a segregated lifestyle until you get to the workplace. And then in the workplace, it's like, bam, all of a sudden, now you're interacting and have these, having these interactions that maybe you've not had before. Mm -hmm. And if that is the first time that you're starting to even broach the subject of race, of course it can be disconcerting because you've simply not done it before. So I think that there's so much value just in as parents, um, as family members, encouraging those conversations internally so that when we go out into the world, we are just more comfortable in our own skin having those conversations. And I do just want to say, Dana, that as much as you can have those conversations, I can honestly say I'm a white person who regularly puts my foot in it. So yes. <laughs> there's no perfect answer. That I think that is the challenge that throughout life, and and maybe it's maybe it's a particularly um, sort of U.S. trait. I don't know. There's this feeling of this is the right way and the wrong way. Yes. And the, there are just ways, you know. And when you choose one way rather than the other way, you never get to measure them. One, one against the other, you've made a choice and you've gone a different path and it works okay or it doesn't work okay or whatever and you have to adapt from there. So it's not right or wrong. It's, it's, I think it's about brave. Be brave. Say what's on your mind and take the consequences. You know, it's just how it is. Yeah, and I put this question up here. I changed the question because now I feel like that's a great answer to one of the answers we're going to talk through for this question. Part of developing that racial stamina is getting away from this expectation of perfection, of saying it right, being perfect. I absolutely think that. I think that the more you change that expectation, the better off you're going to be. Now, certainly there's some practical things you can do. If you want to use kind of a hedge phrase, you might say, well, I'm not sure if I'm saying this perfectly right, or um, I may not be you know, perfectly accurate on this. I mean, no one's expecting that you're a historian, you're an expert. Um, so maybe some of those hedge phrases might make you feel more comfortable. But I think it's also you know, just knowing that you can stick your foot in it and recover. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you kind of go 
you know, through that process, the better off you're going to be. And also, I think that when people know that you're genuine, that you're authentic, that you're trying, it's almost like when I go to France and I'm trying to speak French, it's like they look at me like, oh, bless her heart. You know, most of the time they respond back in English <laughs> and make the most I'm of that. Butchering, I'm butchering, but they know that I'm trying. Yeah. They don't jump all over. Me. Well, sometimes they do, but. Uh, and I know. was going to say, they will jump all over English people because there's just this long standing animosity between French and okay, English. Yeah, we don't I, want have, I have a whole story about that, about me presenting something in French and the comment that I got back. So, um, But that's a whole different story. So. But I think that that's huge. And let me give you another like real life example. I was on a call as like a, a diversity expert. I don't, I don't consider myself a diversity expert, but an anti-racism thought leader. And I used a phrase that was not an appropriate phrase for the LGBT community. It wasn't a slur, but it, it was just not the right wording. And ironically, it's amazing how the universe works. Like the next week, I got a pitch from a publicist and it said like 12 phrases that you probably shouldn't use. And one of them was the phrase that I used. And so when I read it, I, you know, again, it wasn't a slur. It wasn't anything obviously offensive or anything. But when I read it, then I under, like a perfect analogy would be like grandfather clause. Like most people don't really understand where that term comes from. Like, is it like, are you wrong for using the term grandfather? I don't think so. I just think that most people don't really know the history of it. So they're using it just kind of blindly like anybody. I've used the term. Mm -hmm. But once you read and you learn, then I understood why some people in the LGBT community might prefer that I not use that phrase, but instead use a different phrase. So guess what? I learned and I ended up writing an article. I wrote an article for Forbes about, hey, these are like 12 phrases that you probably shouldn't use. So I just tried to embrace it more so from the perspective of, hey, I learned something. Now let me kind of do better and let me share it with some other people. Now, granted, you know, admittedly, people, I didn't have a big embarrassing mm -hmm. um, situation, but I think that just trying to shift that mindset and trying to say, hey, I messed up, I'm going to keep messing up. Just assume that that's the way it's going to work. The other thing I want to say real quick before I jump to you, because I really want to hear your thoughts on this, is there's so much value in relationship. When you have strong relationship with people, it's a much better experience when you do say the, you know, the quote unquote wrong thing or say something that's, it's not really the wrong thing, but something that might be offensive to a particular community or a particular person. And I've had that happen multiple times where I'm talking to a white person that I'm friends with and they, and they know that I do this work. So I think they're more kind of attuned talking to me. And so um, I was talking to somebody and she said some phrase and she said, oh, should I not say that? And I said, no, you really shouldn't say that because of X, Y, Z. And then we just kept going on with our conversation. It wasn't a big deal. It was not like, sometimes I think that white people in particular think that we're just waiting. Like, you know, we're <laughs> waiting for you to say the wrong thing because we want to pounce. And I think that that is, is just not the case particularly when you've got an authentic relationship with that person. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, I wanted to comment on that because I was talking to a friend and colleague last night who is a, you know, a member of the black and brown community or African-American or whatever mm -hmm. her choice of phrase is, and we were talking about mutual acquaintance, and I referred to our mutual acquaintance as Hispanic. And, and my friend I was talking to got very upset and said, you know, they don't call themselves Hispanic. It's Latina or Latinx or whatever. And my uh, and then I said, well, actually, it's the Hispanic friend who told me <laughs> right, she prefers right, yeah, to be right, referred to. Right. She uses that phrase all the time. Yeah. And so that's the other thing is we think there are these, like you said before, there are all these rules about. There's not an answer meant. key. There's not an answer key. No, and, you know. No. Yes. You know what I, you know what I liken it to, and and again I don't want to trivialize it because I do think it's important to do the work and to learn and to try to be precise because I do think words matter. So I don't want to trivialize that at yeah. all. But to a certain extent, I almost some of this I almost liken it to being a trainer because I am a trainer and being like an auditorium uh, full of people and you're trying to get the right temperature. There is no right temperature. I've mm. learned as a trainer, I dress in layers. You know, I bring jackets. But I ask the question, I always ask the group, how does the temperature feel? How is the temperature yeah. for everyone? And then they'll tell me it's too hot or too cold and I'll make an adjustment. 
And then usually somebody else will come back and say, well, now it's too hot or, you know, too cold. But I think what's important is just asking. It's yes. having that intent, well, that was asking, the- being knowledgeable, being sensitive, yeah. and then doing what you can. And then that's really all you can do. Well, and that was what came across when we were having the conversation last night, was when I was able to say to her, our friend had said that's the word that she uses. Then she was like, oh, okay. You know, because it wasn't like I'd glibly used that word. There had been some inquiry and discussion about what do you prefer to hear yourself described as? Yeah. You know, people call me all sorts of things. And that's I think good. that's a great tip. Maybe ask. If you feel like you're in a situation Absolutely. where you're not sure, ask. Most people who are a part of a particular community like it when people ask them. Um, maybe not inundate them, <laughs> but but just to ask, say, hey, I'm just not sure, you know, what term um, you prefer, um, because it may vary from person to person. But also, I think it says a lot about that person. Just you're asking demonstrates that you have some level of sensitivity and some level of empathy. So I think that that is so helpful. So with that, let's go back into a real situation. So Ruth, can you tell us about an example where <laughs> you had one of your first uncomfortable where conversations I put one of my about race? Right now? Yes, when yeah. you put your well, We never actually answered the question about racial stamina, so hopefully we'll come back to that. Yeah, we're going to come back. That's actually supposed to be the next question. Um, so... But there have been many, many, many examples. I'll give a key one, though, because I also think it's part of the answer to increasing understanding. So I I am blessed with a large number of contacts who like to tell me this is what you should try. And sometimes I don't like that, but sometimes I do. And this colleague of, and friend, he said to me, very close to where your house is, where I was living at the time, there's going to be the first ever Black Yoga Teachers Association Conference. And it will be predominantly black and brown people, surprise. And he said, I think you should go. I think you should go and see what it feels like. And I said, well, it feels, to, to between him and me, I said, it feels a little weird because, you know, it's the Black Yoga Teachers Association Conference. I feel like I'm um, Marching intruding, in. yeah. yeah, intruding mm-hmm. upon something. And he said, no, no, you'll be fine. And I'll be there too. So, you know, you'll have oh, a Was he one. black or was he white? He's black. Okay. So, yeah, so he said... Um, yeah, unfortunately, he's multiple times been pulled over for driving while black. So we'd had a lot of conversations about this. So he said, uh, please, don't worry about it. Be absolutely fine. And I'll be there, you know, so you'll have at least one friend in the room. So I arrive, there's 134 people in the room, four of whom are look like me. Well, three look like me because I'm the fourth person. In terms of, you know, pale skin and I can tell you, when you're in a room of brown and black people, you look really, really white. Mm-hmm. Um, and I stood there and I was like, this is one of the few times. Once when I went to uh, a perfor- a music performance, I was in the minority, but that was music and we were all dancing and I didn't really, you know, wasn't so hyper aware. But I looked around and suddenly I was that person. And we lo- I remember looking at the other three white people and we- I'm pretty sure we all had the same thought. Is it acceptable to come together, you know, with this sort of sense of safety in numbers or does that look like we can only handle being with white people and so really we should mix with everyone else? And I walked into the room and one person came up to me and asked why I was there and I said, you know, I, I like yoga and meditation and I live close by so I thought I would come and join. She was like, that's great, welcome, wonderful. The more the merrier, it's fantastic. Someone else came up and said to me, why are you here? I explained, same explanation. And she said, there are so many, so many events for white people. Why do you have to come to ours? Why are you mm-hmm. here? And I immediately looked at my friend, you know, like, told you. (laughs) Right, right. And he said, well, the thing is, both of those answers, you're going to hear both of those answers. And in those two days, to say it was one long, uncomfortable conversation, I mean, it seemed Mm -hmm. like I couldn't open my mouth without saying something, offended someone, but for somebody else was perfectly okay. So that Mm -hmm. I think I had a sort of immersion in that. And also I really appreciated having that experience of being one of the only in the room because I've got friends and colleagues for whom that is everyday life. And I don't think white people, when we're talking about stamina, I don't think a lot of white people in this country really know what that feels like to walk into a room over and and that be the norm, that you walk in, you look around and you don't see anyone who looks like you and that's 
the normal way of things being. It's not like you walk in, you go, wow, this is weird. Let Whereas us know when in the we comments. Walk in, it's weird. Yeah. Let weird. us know in the comments. I think that that is so important. It's like that's like step one. Have you been the only person? Like try to put yourself in that other person's position. Have you been the only person in the room? I was talking to my former boss, Jim, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about this because we were talking about white privilege and defining kind of what white privilege was, et cetera. I said, you know, I'll just give you one tiny, tiny little example. I was like, how many meetings, how many business meetings have you been in in your career? So let's think about this. You've worked for probably 20, 30 you probably work for 30 years. If you have, t and I, when I say meeting, I don't mean just two people. I mean like a meeting larger than say five people or so. So if you've got two meetings uh, a day on average times, um, uh, I don't know, 350 days a year, that's 700 a year. So easily now we're looking at 15, 20,000 meetings. So out of 15 to 20 or probably 25,000, thousand meetings how many of those do you think you've been the only white person i mean literally out of twenty five thousand meetings how many of them have you been the only white person the answer either is zero or rounds to zero okay <laughs> <laughs> and and that and that's not to be negative or pejorative but it's just to show you the stark difference for most black or brown people we have just had to live a life of getting used to being the only black or brown person and and becoming comfortable so as we get into this final question of how do you build this how do you recommend others develop racial stamina and how have you developed racial stamina if you can try to answer both of those um, I will also say, I think that is one great example is just to start to place yourself into these situations that are predominantly black and brown. And it probably will feel somewhat uncomfortable, but just like with exercise, remember when you start a new routine, you start exercise, you get sore. You get sore because you're working muscles you haven't worked before. But if you keep doing it after a while, you're not getting sore anymore mm -hmm. because those muscles are more used to that. So, Ruth, I just want to throw it to you and please be as practical as you can. Um, but just, you know, give people advice. You know, what have you done mm -hmm. to build that racial stamina and what would you recommend others do to develop that racial stamina? So uh, one of the things that I would well, so on a day when I'm feeling extremely impatient, people with people I will just say you know suck it up and get on with it because but I think it comes back to that sense of putting yourself in the other person's shoes so I, I hear a lot of white people saying and actually I was discussing this with another friend yesterday I hear a lot of white people saying oh no not the race topic again especially when you see it in a television show or something like that not the race topic again as though it's some isolated topic that you can sort of put in or pull out you know mm -hmm. as you as you, and not something that's there all the time um or they get tired because they start to become aware of things like the history you start reading more about history right. and you realize that this is ingrained and has been going on for ever and it's hard to turn around and there's this sort of cumulative effect of one thing after another and white people will say to me i'm tired Right. And so the thing that I recommend is for them to think about and how tiring is it to be someone that has no choice but to deal with it every day. You know, you're tired because you read about it or, or I'm tired because I read about it or because I watched a program about it or because I've heard it from three or four people that I know. They're tired because they have to navigate everything else I do, family drama, choosing the right school for their kids and all of that and factor in. What's it going to be like if their kids are the only kids of color in that school? What's the experience going to be like? They have to go to work every day and potentially be the only or one of the few or be in that situation where most people, black and brown people, are in positions that are considered sort of um, less there's, there's there's less prestige to those positions. And so, right, right. you know, well, you well, walk well, in yeah. and people assume that you're getting the coffee or that you're one of the cleaners or I've seen sure. that happen. 
that's the every day for a lot of the people that I mean I we're experiencing it. It's like sometimes you're tired of reading about it, but we're yeah. tired of experiencing or it. Or hearing about it, it, you know. And, Which and also other... oh sorry, just one quick thing before yeah. I, I'll let you finish up. Um the other thing that this relates to is for us it's not optional. Yes. You know, sometimes when I hear that, it makes it feel like, oh God, like anti-racism, like I'm, I don't have time for that today or I don't have time. Well, we, you know, kind of can't take a day off, you know, in terms of, you know, my blackness shows up wherever I show up. So mm -hmm. I have to be ready for me. It's not really optional. I mean, I have children, you know, I have to, you know, move through this world and I want my children to be able to realize their full potential. I want to be able to realize my full potential. So, you know, unfortunately for, for them, it might be optional, but for me, it, it feels mandatory. It's not something I can opt out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. So that that's uh, yeah, that's kind of exactly what I was thinking as well, is that, you know, you can't check in and check out of being a person with brown skin. I can't check in and check out of being a person with white skin either. I mean, though, we do share that. But the implications of sharing that are very, are, are very different. But, you know, we are what we are. Yeah. Right. What I am is someone who is the default for the system and is more likely to be given the benefit of the doubt than someone who has brown or black skin and that's a disadvantage there's no doubt right so as we close because i know you've also got lots of background with anxiety and mental health coaching imagine you are that white person who's in that meeting and the conversation comes up and you you feel like you want to engage but again you're not sure if you should or, or how you should or maybe someone's kind of attacked you a little bit maybe somebody said something that's you know putting you on guard what else can you recommend? What are some other techniques or tips? Or, yeah. Get or curious. Mm -hmm. Get curious, I would say. So what, something else I thank my father for a thousand times a week is the phrase, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which he told me when I was preparing to give a presentation. And I very dismissively said, you're perfectly comfortable giving um, presentations. You do it so easily. I mean, he could do a presentation off the cuff. And he said, I'm always terrified. I have responsibility to my audience and that get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I really, really appreciate it. And when you're in that situation, like if someone's attacking you because they feel that you said something inappropriate, ask them about it. You know, mm. so I am apologize that it came across that way. You don't have to apologize for being you or anything like that, but apologize that it came across that way and ask, how would you, you know, how do you want me to convey that or, what are some, uh, what's some language that is okay with you? Ask them to get involved in essentially solving the challenge and then it becomes a collaborative effort and it's less you against me, me against them and, and all of that kind of stuff. It's, and it's hard to do, just acknowledge that you're not always gonna feel comfortable doing that, but you know, be, be, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it's the same advice I give to people when they're facing anxiety. You're anxious and, right. you're not anxious or. Right. So you're anxious and you have a choice as to whether you take the next step or do what you do or, or whatever. And this is you're uncomfortable and you have an opportunity to explore with this person or these people this sensitive topic and be the brave one who says, well, let's talk about that. What what's what's going on there? What is that? And mean? how do you define bravery? And bravery is being bloody uncomfortable and doing it anyway. So I will. Uh, Dana knows that when I took my character strengths assessment, the VIA character strengths assessment, I came out high in bravery, which is actually as a high strength is unusual. And I was like, me, brave, that is the most ridiculous thing. This assessment sucks. It's no good because I couldn't see myself as brave until I took a step back because I've struggled with anxiety for most of my life. And um, I took a step back and I realized I've struggled with, with anxiety and move to a new country, taken new jobs, taken up right. challenges. I can be anxious and I can go and do something. So I can be really uncomfortable and do it anyway. And that is bravery. Being right. uncomfortable and taking that step is a form of bravery. Yes, that's awesome. And again, I always try to make these shorter, but they, <laughs> I haven't been able to do it yet. I'm at 45 minutes. I also, I want to thank Ruth, but I also want to offer you guys um, some some other tips and some conversation crutches. I, I love this. Well, before you do that, before you do that, Dana, can I just offer one thing? Because sure. you were saying about the character strengths, and I meant to mention this. So one of the things that I found with our coaches, and if you you check us out, you'll see, you know, it's quite a mixed bunch of people, both in terms of 
life experience and also what we offer coaching in as well, when we're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, we all use the character strengths. And one of the things that is, um, is, has turned out coincidentally to be amazing is that when you start with strengths, that is something everyone shares, regardless of you know race or culture or traditions or religion, we share them. And also when you start by seeing someone through their strengths, mm. you start to build a connection with them right away. And so to be able to say to someone, you know, wow, I really appreciated your fairness in that meeting today because you made sure everyone had an opportunity to, to give their opinion or speak their truth or whatever you want, however you want to phrase it. People start to feel safer and they engage with you better or more effectively. And, and that I've found is tremendously helpful because it's powerful and neutral. It has nothing to do with any of these difficult conversations. So we start exploring our similarities and our differences in a safe way. And then it becomes a step to say, well, let's look beyond that. You know, what right. are some other differences? What are some other similarities? And I find that all the time. It's like having that point of similarity, that point of connection, that authentic relationship just provides a platform and then you can build on that platform. Yeah. It makes everything else so much easier. And just remind them if they want to learn more about character strengths, where they can go. Well, actually, I, I would suggest um, selfishly that you go to my website, which is projectmotivator.com. And if anyone out there is a project manager, that's what I've been for like 100 years. Not anymore. I'm a coach. But um, go to projectmotivator.com because there's lots of stuff there about the character strengths and then there are ways that you can link in to get your free survey and find out what your ranking of 24 character strengths is for free. So. Okay, awesome. And I know we've run out of time, but if you want some more practical tips in this area, you want some more of those conversation crutches, ironically, I just published a new article in Forbes uh, on my Forbes page this morning that relates to this. And I had interviewed a psychotherapist, um, Andrew Horning, who's written about this, and he gives a listing of specific tips that people should use, particularly white people should use. I mean, it's practical as saying, hey, if you need to pause, if you need to take a deep breath, get some water, if you want to, you know, ask for some examples, not in a, you know, snippy, nasty kind of way, but just say, oh, uh, tell me more. Help me understand that. I really want to learn about that. It's that curiosity that you were talking about, Ruth. It's like, instead of getting defensive, if you could turn it into curiosity and say, gosh, I hadn't realized that. Mm -hmm. Help me understand that. Tell me more. I, I really want to work through this. I really want to better understand that. I, I think it's huge. It's it's not just huge for your being able to participate in that particular conversation, but I think it's huge for elevating the potential for relationship, for relationship building with that person or with that, that group of people. So check out that article as well. So with that, I want to thank Ruth. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dana. It was so, such a privilege to be asked on the show. So thank you for thank you for thinking that I would have anything meaningful to say. So I appreciate that. Of course, of course. And um, thank you. Just putting up a few final uh, comments here. And we just want to thank you guys um, and certainly check out this LinkedIn group, the Systemic Diversity and Inclusion Group. And we just want to thank you for joining. And please check us out every first and third Tuesday. We try to keep it casual, informative. We try to, you know, let you hear conversation that you're typically not going to hear other places. But it's the conversation we really need to have. It's the things that we need to say to one another. And, you know, one of the things I was saying to a white person the other day is, you know, sometimes when, when black people, or black, black or brown people share some of these things with you, or maybe even if they pull your coattail a little bit or make a suggestion, instead of getting defensive, think of it also, remember that if they didn't believe in you, if they didn't believe that the relationship with you wasn't important, if they didn't believe that you're someone who's out here trying to do amazing things and, you know, trying to be a great ally, they wouldn't waste their time. Because yeah. I promise you, there are tons of people, I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't waste my breath. So when someone reaches out and, you know, wants to talk to you about something or wants to suggest something, that also doesn't mean we're right. You know, I also want to put that out there. It doesn't mean that anytime a black person says something that, you know, we always have the high ground or we're always right. But I just think that it speaks so much to how much they must value you and how much they must have faith in you in terms of your ability to take that information in and process it 
and just improve not just yourself, but your environment. So just really think about it from that perspective. So just thank you guys so much. We really, really appreciate it. And we are going to be back um, first Tuesday. I think it might be the first, it might be the first of June. Back with Karen this time. Thank you guys. Thank you, Ruth. Thank See you. Guys.